Okay, are we live yet? Good afternoon. Yes, go ahead, Ernie. The floor is yours. But, uh, let's pull up the first slide, if we could. All right, this is Ernie Joy, and I'm uh, president of the Association of Food and Drug Officials, and I'd like to welcome you to the AFTA webinar concerning hepatitis A. Um, we've got some, uh, let me see if we can pull the slides up here. Here we go. Okay, so if we go to the second slide. All right, there we go. So one of the things that APTO is doing this year is focusing on what's causing foodborne illness and what can we provide you that will help reduce illnesses. And, and right now, uh, one of the big things that, that's been a threat in the country is we have hepatitis A outbreaks in, in numerous states. Um, look at uh, CDC's website today, it's showing over 26,000 illnesses and over 262 deaths and uh, over and one of the things that's likely to happen is with cold weather uh, and the homeless and drug users being pushed to uh, you know, shelters is the number of cases is a potential for increase. And while most of the illnesses have been person to person, there is always the potential for you know, outbreaks associated with a food worker. And we've seen numerous food workers uh, who have been ill for, with hepatitis A, the vast majority have not resulted in outbreaks, but in the last month, there was a report in the press of uh, one food worker causing an outbreak with 27 ill and a death. So um, today, uh, we've got some, some great speakers on board to, to kind of talk through what's been done in various areas to uh, prevent additional illnesses and see if we can uh, you know, help stop the outbreak. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, this just shows the distribution of cases. And you only see a number of maps today. Uh, but this is the map that was showing um, when, you know, with CDC when we uh, planned the webinar. Um, and the darker the color, the higher the concentration. And at that point in time, um, well, at this point in time, I guess there's been over 4,900 cases in Kentucky, over 3,300 cases in Ohio, uh, 2,900 cases in Florida. So again, the darker the color, the, the higher the number of illnesses, uh, the higher the attack rate, basically. Um, so it just shows you it's hit most of the country. Uh, next slide. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, I've introduced myself, again, Ernie Julian. Um, uh, my day job is I'm Chief of the Office of Food Protection, Department of Health in Rhode Island. I've uh, been there over 30 years. Uh, also serve on the Council to Improve Foodborne Outbreak Response. And one of the tools that will be coming out within the next year is uh, C4 will come out with the new guidelines. So watch for that in the next year. Um, our speakers, we're very uh, happy to have Dr. Monique Foster. Uh, she's an MD, MPH, Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, Medical Epidemiologist, Division of Viral Hepatitis with CDC. Dr. Uh, Foster serves as the uh, Epidemiology Lead for Hepatitis A in the Division of Viral Hepatitis at CDC. She's a graduate of East Carolina University and Eastern Virginia Medical School and received her MPH from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Foster completed her pediatric residency at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and a pediatric, pediatric infectious disease fellowship at Vanderbilt before joining CDC as an epidemic intelligence survey service officer with the Division of Viral Hepatitis in 2014. Uh, we're also um, you know, very fortunate to have Dr. Laura Brown, who works at CDC, leading the National Center for Environmental Health Safe Food Section. This team conducts research and surveillance on retail food safety and foodborne outbreaks. Dr. Brown has worked on such diverse food safety topics as ill food workers, hand hygiene, and food cooling practices. Uh, we also have uh, Lisa Hainstock, who's the Food Safety Specialist, Emergency Response and Enforcement Unit, Food and Dairy Division, Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural, Rural Development. Lisa has worked for Michigan Department of Agriculture as a food safety specialist since 2002. She started her career in environmental health in 1990, working as a sanitarian at the local health department in rural Michigan. She then moved to the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality as a non-community public health water supply consultant in 1998. In her current position in the Emergency Response and Enforcement Unit, she coordinates and provides training in foodborne illness investigations, tracebacks and recalls, and works closely with the food industry, local, state, and federal investigators in these events. She has represented APTO on C4 since 2008, and she currently chairs the C4 Industry Workgroup. Uh, today we also have Mary Beth DeMarco, 
who serves as the Outbreak Net Enhanced Epidemiologist at the Virginia Department of Health, Office of Epidemiology, Division of Surveillance and Investigations. As a member of the Foodborne Disease Epidemiology Team, Mary Beth coordinates the monitoring and reporting of foodborne and communicable disease outbreaks to the CDC National Outbreak Reporting System, NORS. She has also aids in the investigations of whole genome sequencing, enteric disease clusters throughout Virginia, as well as assists the regional and local health department, um, local district health departments, epidemiologist investigations of foodborne and communicable disease outbreaks by gathering data, case finding, and reporting outbreaks. She's a member of the Virginia Rapid Response Team. So we've got a great mix of CDC and, and state uh, departments of health and agriculture to, to kind of talk you through this today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Foster from CDC. Great, thanks for that introduction. Um, um, and thanks for allowing me to speak this afternoon. So I'm gonna give a brief description of the hepatitis A virus epidemiology here in the US and then speak a little bit about the recent outbreaks we've seen over the last three years. Next slide, please. Just a little background on the virus itself, and you're not supposed to be able to read that poster. It's just one of the um, communications materials that are available on our website. Uh, hepatitis A, as you know, is transmitted fecal orally, and it happens after ingestion. It's replicated in the liver and then excreted out through the stool. Now, illness is typically acute and self-limited, which means most people recover in a few weeks to months without medical treatment. Clinical symptoms are indistinguishable from acute hepatitis B or C infection or other causes of inflammation of the liver. The average incubation is 28 days, but it has a long range, 15, 15 to 55, zero days. An infected person can excrete virus in their stool for up to two weeks prior to becoming symptomatic and thus tr transmit most often to household and other close contacts before the infected person knows that they are ill. Next slide. The United States is no longer considered endemic for hepatitis A virus. During the transition from high endemicity to low endemicity, we used to see cyclic increases in hepatitis A infections that occurred about every 10 to 15 years. Prior to when the hepatitis A vaccine became available in 1996, the number of reported cases remained on average around 21,000 annually. And when you account for underdiagnosis and underreporting, the actual number is estimated to be at least twice as high. Next slide. So here is our latest national epi curve of all the cases of hepatitis A infections that have been reported to the CDC um, starting in the summer, uh, starting in the beginning of 2017 through uh, two weeks ago. That red dashed line indicates three standard deviations above what was reported to us in the five years prior to the start of these recent outbreaks. So in non-outbreak years, CDC received on average 29 cases reported per week. So you can see we're well above that. Next slide. The increase in reported cases is primarily due to hepatitis A outbreaks among persons who report drug use and homelessness that we are now seeing in at least 30 states that Dr. Julian alluded to. Next slide. As Dr. Julian mentioned, this is a map and data from our outbreak website, which is updated every Monday. Currently, there are over 26,000 hepatitis A cases reported from 30 states. Over 15,000 individuals have been hospitalized for a rate of 60%, which is high for hepatitis A virus infection. And there have been 262 deaths since the outbreak started in July of 2016 through last week. This map shows which states are reporting outbreaks and identifies which states are being hit particularly hard. But since these are cumulative case counts, it doesn't really show that outbreaks are resolving in some states like Kentucky, Michigan, and West Virginia and increasing in others. Next slide. In the past, large community outbreaks like the ones we're seeing now were really associated with asymptomatic children who then infected adults who cared for them. But with the widespread adoption of the universal childhood vaccination recommendations, asymptomatic children really are not the main drivers of community hepatitis A outbreaks. Although the overall incidence rate of hepatitis A infection has decreased within all age groups, 
there's still a large adult population with at-risk behaviors and exposures like drug use and transient living situations that are not immune to infection and they're exposed through person-to-person -person contact in crowded and possibly unhygienic conditions. Next slide. Vaccination really is, uh, vaccination and outreach to the groups at risk really is um, key to stopping these outbreaks. And we know that this can be challenging for many reasons, including that um, sometimes these groups are marginalized, they have mistrust of the government due to fear of arrest and mental illnesses, and limited ability to access routine medical care. So vaccinating the recommended groups within specialized settings like syringe services programs, homeless shelters, and substance abuse treatment centers is important for engaging people in needed health care and disease prevention. Persons who use drugs and men who have sex with men have been recommended to be vaccinated against hepatitis A since the vaccine became available in 1996. And that's because community outbreaks among these groups were seen frequently in the past. Next slide. The majority of the cases reported to CDC during these outbreaks really are among persons reporting risk exposures or behaviors such as drug, drug use. And that's both injection and non-injection drug use, and then transient living situations or homelessness and men who have sex with men. Of the cases that report no risk, when you look closer to the data, a significant portion of those um, individuals in the remaining 40% or so have either been lost to follow-up and not at, been asked about those risk behaviors, or report close contact to individuals with those risk factors. For example, a household contact or someone who volunteers regularly in a homeless shelter. Only 5% of cases report handling food as an occupation in these outbreaks, while over 60% of the cases, and in some jurisdictions, up to 90% report drug use or homelessness. Despite this, the majority of media reports you see and public notifications are about hepatitis A infected food handlers. There's no evidence that these recent community outbreaks are due to a common source or are being propagated by food handlers. But why we see such emphasis on food handlers in the media is likely because even though it is rare, depending on the circumstances, secondary transmission from food handlers can still occur, um, whether these outbreaks are occurring or not, as Dr. Julian mentioned. Next slide. So how does foodborne transmission of hepatitis A occur when we do see it? And I know all of you probably know this, that contamination of food by hepatitis A virus can occur at any point during harvesting, processing, distribution, or preparation. But food-associated hepatitis A outbreaks are commonly associated with prepared foods contaminated by infected food handlers, fresh produce contaminated by human feces at any point during production and packing, whether through workers' hands or contact with contaminated water, and lastly, um, molluscan shellfish contaminated by feces and growing waters. Hepatitis A infected food handler episodes had actually declined, mirroring the overall decline in incidents observed nationally prior to 2016. Next slide. So whenever I'm called or my colleagues are called here in the Division of Viral Hepatitis Epidemiology team and consulted by state and local health jurisdictions about a hepatitis A infected food handler, this is the algorithm that we start with when determining the need for public notification or prophylaxis after exposure um, for the patrons. Ig or immunoglobulin has largely been replaced by hepatitis A vaccine, which has been found to be more effective in providing protection to people with good immune systems. We recognize that hygiene assessments can be subjective, but um, visiting food handling areas and interviews with in the infected food handler, coworkers, and supervisors are off often helpful, and this is the information that we ask for. We ask to hear about the food handler's self-assessment, assessments obtained for supervisors or coworkers, uh, uh, particularly whether the food handler had diarrhea while at work or the presence of any medical conditions that might make hygiene more difficult to maintain. Of course, glove use and availability of hand washing facilities, hygiene training, and previous sanitation assessments. Uh, most state and local health departments have this algorithm, and, and not every situation falls nicely into this algorithm, and that's usually when um, we're called to kind of discuss the outliers. And of course, there's variability among um, the states on whether they even consult CDC to discuss next steps before issuing a patron or media notification. Next slide. 
I know Dr. Brown and others are going to speak about these in detail, and you guys uh, are probably quite aware of this. Um, but uh, whether an outbreak is occurring or not, it's really important that managers and companies encourage proper hand washing and hand hygiene and eliminate bare hand contact with foods that are ready to eat. Employees and managers should feel comfortable to discuss their clinical symptoms and recent diagnoses, and uh, HIPAA and ADA does not prevent those conversations from happening. It's really important that managers and employees recognize that employees should not be working if they're having vomiting, diarrhea, or jaundice, or other sorry, symptoms consistent with hepatitis A, and if they notice these things, they should stop work immediately and report to their manager who can exclude or restrict workers. Um, often I'm called to, to um, give advice about how long food handlers should be restricted from work, and each state really has different exclusion policies. For example, some states exclude for 10 days after jaundice, some um, require 14 days, and some require um, testing to be obtained. Next slide. Lastly, I just want to bring awareness to the materials that are on our website that can be displayed in staff areas. It's understood that employees with certain risk behaviors um, that are driving these outbreaks may not want to report why they are at risk for hepatitis A infection to their employer, but um, that doesn't stop us from having the duty to keep them informed that vaccination is available if they are part of these risk groups. And that can be done by, um, you know, posters or contacting your local health department about any vaccine clinics that may occur. Next slide. With that, I'll thank you. Here's the team, our part of the team that's been working hard on these outbreaks for the last three years. And my email address is at the bottom of the slide. Thanks, everybody. I think we're taking questions at the end. Uh, so let's uh, move on to uh, Dr. Brown, and then we will take uh, questions for everybody at the end. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and just talk to you guys briefly about um, a CDC newsletter that we sent out recently about hepatitis A and food establishments. So if you'll go on to the next screen. Um, I just wanted to um, give you a brief background on who I am and where we come from. As most of you know, the C CDC has several different centers. Um, so, for example, Dr. Foster and I work in different centers. I work in the National Center for Environmental Health in the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice. So, as you can tell from the name, we're really focused on environmental health. And one of our primary goals is to support and improve environmental public health practice. So one of our goals is to really help those who are on the front lines and state and local health departments do their jobs, particularly when it comes to food and water safety. So next slide. So one of the things that we send out as part of this, of meeting this goal is a newsletter, an environmental health services newsletter. It goes out once a week. And primarily it's short and quick and it mostly provides resources for environmental health professionals. So often it's recent work that we've done or recent work that some of our other public health agencies have done really targeted towards helping environmental health professionals do their jobs. We have 54,000 readers. And this newsletter is really handled by our communication staff, which, which really helps us keep that language sort of friendly and not too dense and not too complicated, just a quick, hey, here's some things you might want to know. Um, so I've included the link here for how to sign up for that newsletter. This is also sort of the landing page for all of our work. So you can go here to learn more about what we do, and you can also go here to sign up for this newsletter if you haven't already. Next slide. So last week, or, um, or maybe a month ago, our leadership came to us and said, hey, hepatitis A is in the news all the time, and we know that it's not happening a lot at food establishments, but we also know that there's sort of a lot of buzz about that, or some anxiety about it. Do you think we should, you know, put some resources out? And we said, sure, we can do that. So, la so we worked to pull sort of existing resources. Nothing is new or, um, you know, nothing is something that you haven't already seen before, but we thought we'd send out a reminder of, hey, one of the key, these are some of the key things that you can do to help prevent um, hepatitis A outbreaks and any other kind of outbreak in your establishment. Um, so, sort of the point of this newsletter was, hey, here's three important actions that food establishments can take to prevent illness. Uh, our communications people really like us to chunk our information, and so, so we've got three chunks 
of information um, in the newsletter. The next slide. So our first chunk is exclude ill food workers, and a really important step that you can take to help protect customers and restaurants is to exclude ill food workers. Uh, we know that infected food handlers can spread hepatitis A even if they don't have symptoms. Um, so if, if someone has been diagnosed um, with hepatitis A or has symptoms of hepatitis A, you need to exclude them. You may need to review your local or state food codes to find the specific criteria for these kinds of actions. Um, and then uh, we also point out that um, sometimes managers are reluctant to talk to their food workers about their symptoms because they feel like they may be prohibited from doing so by various federal regulations. And we just like to remind people that when it comes to public health, when it comes to sickness that can transmit through food, you can absolutely talk to your food workers about that. So the newsletter includes these bullets and then it also includes links to particular resources that can help. So anywhere that you see the yellow underlined, that's a link to a resource that might be helpful to a health department or to a restaurant. Next slide. Please. Um, so our second chunk of information is ensuring proper hand hygiene. This is probably one of the most important things we can do to help prevent the spread of hepatitis A. And essentially, you just need to avoid bare hand contact with ready to eat foods, of course, as well as um, appropriate and adequate hand washing. Um, and again, we have a link here to the CDC hand washing website. Next slide. And then finally, um, our last chunk of information is about uh, disinfection. Um, if you disinfect appropriately, you can uh, re really reduce the risk of transmission of hepatitis A. So again, we sort of walk through the steps of using disinfectants, um, discarding food that's handled by food workers that might have been infected with hepatitis A and disinfecting, and then having a plan for cleaning up vomit um, and keeping germs out of the kitchen. And again, everywhere that you see yellow underlined words, we have links to resources that we thought might be helpful to health departments and to restaurants. Um, so I will stop there. Just wanted to do a quick review of these resources that we sent out, and um, I'm happy to take questions at, at the end of the call. Thank you, Laura. Uh, what we'll do is uh, the slides and the presentations will be online in about a week, and we'll have some other information at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentations about some grants that are also available from NAFTO, and all of that will be online. So, with that, I'd like to turn it over to to uh, Lisa. All right. Thank you, Ernie. Um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, just briefly, I'm going to go over a brief description of Michigan's outbreak and then talk a little bit about how different agencies and entities partnered to address educating the food industry on the hepatitis A risks we were dealing with and some of the prevention strategies. And uh, then talk a little bit about some of the examples of what industry was doing to respond to hepatitis and a few of the lessons that we learned. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this slide right here is actually gives you a current idea of the outbreak situation in Michigan as of uh, September 25th. So this is as of last Wednesday. Uh, so we have a total of 920 cases uh, and 30 deaths. So I understand that the dates on the bottom are a little bit hard to read, but you'll see that roughly in July of 2017, um, we started to see in a very large spike in cases. So our cases really started in August of 2016, but in mid-2017, we started to see a significant jump. And uh, soon the numbers really began to exceed the previous national records at the time. So uh, on August, excuse me, October 31st, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services actually activated the Community Health Emergency Coordination Center, the CHEC, to coordinate the response of the multiple jurisdictions involved in the hepatitis A outbreak. And the very next day on November 1st, the State Emergency Operations Center was activated by the Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, next slide, please. So as uh, has been mentioned multiple times, we were seeing uh, much the same risk factors that a number of other states that have had subsequent outbreaks have seen. Uh, we were seeing um, risk factors not associated with food, but um, you know many of these other ones here. Uh, most, many of the cases were primarily found in the counties and 
South Central and Southeast Michigan amongst these populations uh, with these risk factors. And um, it was definitely proving to be challenging to reach these high risk populations with messages. Uh, next slide, please. Um, along about the time that we were seeing the first jump in cases in mid-2017, uh, we started to have a much bigger concern about food worker transmission. Up until that time, we'd really only seen about a handful of infected food workers. Um, but by the end of 2017, we had uh, 22 infected food workers, and that number was rising. And um, also amongst those food workers, we saw that um, their case characteristics were mirroring the general outbreak population, meaning that uh, in general, they also shared a number of the same risk factors that we were seeing in the in other infected people. So exactly what that meant is it uh, meant that they were more prevalent in food service employees. Uh, it, we really couldn't say, but if it was hard to reach high risk populations, we were faced with the dilemma of how we were gonna reach out to food employees as well. Next slide, please. So in order to best address this issue, we really felt that, you know, not one agency could really do this any justice. So we knew that we needed to partner with different entities with um, the involvement here because we needed to best leverage each other's capabilities and resources. Um, both the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and local health departments obviously had involvement with the both the surveillance and uh, vaccination programs and local health also had um, the environmental health responsibility for food service facilities amongst the state. Our Michigan Department of Agriculture has uh, Boots on the ground investigators where food service or food workers are ill in the regulated facilities at retail and uh, manufactured facilities. And then obviously CDC had uh, guidance and resources available as well. What I'd like to bring your attention to though is uh, the city of San Diego uh, was also undergoing a very large outbreak of hepatitis A at roughly the same time as Michigan. So we found that uh, by doing a search online that they had developed also some outreach materials for the food industry regarding hepatitis A response and vaccination recommendations. So we contacted them uh, and asked them if we could use some of their material as a template and began to use that to develop guidance for uh, reaching out to industry in collaboration with our other industries and agencies. Well, we also talked to industry itself because we knew that we needed to partner with them because not only did they need to be aware of the risks and, and know what their responsibilities were for following up with food workers if and when there was a, a worker in their facility, but also we knew that they could um, provide us assistance and leveraging their communication channels. Next slide, please. So marketers claim through the rule of seven that you can, people need to hear something at least seven times before they're gonna act on it. So with this in mind, we knew that we needed to basically flood the food worker market with as much information as possible. So there was a lot of things going on uh, concurrently. There was a lot of press releases going out as you've seen in some of the previous out, uh, things going on here with the food worker incidents um, that were advertising things about uh, post-exposure prophylaxis as well as vaccination clinics. But also our industry partners were allowing us to work with them in leveraging their newsletters uh, to get information out to their members as much as possible. And we worked with our food safety task force and in getting information out at any conferences possible. Uh, to talk about what was going on with hepatitis A in, the in Michigan and the United States and let them know what the risks were if it got out into uh, the food community. There was a grant issued to the Michigan Restaurant Association uh, that allowed them to provide free online serve safe training in the high incidence areas of the state uh, because we wanted to get as many people as possible to get out there and get training uh, and not have an excuse to not get certified managers in these facilities. And finally, 
we sent out an informational mailer to over 55,000 food and dairy establishments statewide. And those were establishments that were regulated by both local health department and by the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. We sent this out via snail mail, then we also, for any facilities where we had emails, we sent those out an email as well. Um, and the great part about using the state emergency operations centers, it put us to the head of the line when it came to leveraging IT resources for this email dissemination. We also leveraged our inspectors. They were armed with um, these handouts so they could also go and put these right in the hands of the operators themselves because we wanted to make sure that there was no reason that each and every facility did not have at least one um, batch of these hard copies in front of them. Next slide, please. So some of the tools that we developed, and this is just um, some of them here, uh, were a informational tool, a front and back page that was um, talked to the operators about uh, the risks of what was going on with the hepatitis A, what symptoms they should be looking out for amongst their uh, employees and what they should do if they identified a positive worker. Um, there was a poster for them to post over the time clock or in their break rooms for food workers um, to see what the symptoms are. Um, there was disinfection guidance and multiple uh, different versions of this, as well as an infographics poster. And um, all of these are available in multiple languages in online versions on both the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services website as well as the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development websites. So if you just go to the next slide, we're just gonna breeze through a couple of web shots here to show you what some of this looks like. So you'll see here that this is just a, a real simple thing here. What is hepatitis A? How is it spread? Uh, and letting them know that yes, there is an outbreak going on and, and we need your help. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just the top part of a poster that's an eight and a half by 14 inch uh, cardstock poster. It does have color photographs on here that show uh, what jaundice looks like and what uh, some of the high risk uh, factors are for transmission. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also found, too, that when it came to responding to a food facility that had a positive food worker, that um, different agencies had different levels of experience with exactly what questions they should be asking and pieces of information they should be obtaining from the operators. So we used um, different resources out available for CDC and from other states to come up with a check sheet for regulatory guidance uh, follow-up at the uh, facility. And this actually is um, something that it could be used at both retail and manufacturing. Uh, and we made this available to inspectors at the local and the state level. Uh, the nice part about it is it's a um, focused on, as a risk assessment and it also gives follow-up recommendations at the, for the operator um, that the inspector can give them and can also leave them a copy uh, so that the operator has some basic information. Uh, one of the complications sometimes too is that some of these outbreaks, or excuse me, some of these positive A food workers uh, might be dealing with a facility that has um, both local and state uh, regulatory responsibility. So we needed to be able to work together with um, the sister agencies to find out that uh, we were getting all of the appropriate information and sharing it as soon as possible. Next slide, please. So we found we had some really great industry response when ill food workers were identified. Um, by and large, all of the places where we ended up having any positive A food workers identified, they were really good in working with uh, the local health department officials in setting up uh, PEP clinics for uh, employees who had been exposed. 
some of the major retailers that actually had their own pharmacies available began to actually offer PEP to their own employees, which um, actually helped a lot, especially when there was uh, vaccine shortages at the end of 2017 going into the 2018 season. And um, one thing that we found was very positive as well was that a number of the uh, food facilities had a great willingness to both advertise and host uh, some mobile vaccination clinics at venues that were very popular with the high risk populations, uh, including some of the nightclubs and everything that catered to um, the uh, gay population. Next slide, please. So a couple of things that we learned is that even if food really isn't a primary transmission mode, that it, it so behooves everybody to consider this as a risk that we need to address and plan for. Um, and that no matter what you do in terms of online and radio messaging, um, no matter how hard it is to get out there, if you can put things directly into people's hands, don't expect that people are gonna go look for it. Do everything you can to deliver it directly. Engage with industry. They've got a lot of opportunities and abilities to get the message out there. If you can get them on your side and properly convey uh, risk to them, let them know that it's in their best interest to work with you and try to prevent hepatitis A transmission, uh, they can be really, really good partners there. And then finally, we found that um, helping our partner agencies where we can uh, was really great. Um, San Diego helped us a lot, and we in turn, as other states were starting to find have their own outbreaks, we were able to share our tools and were able to um, help them out as well. This is supposedly a live link here uh, where you can click to some of our resources, but um, if you can't get there, you can go to www.michigan.gov forward slash hepatitis A response. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the next speaker. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, great resources. And with that, uh, Mary Beth DeMarco will, um, will tell us what's going on with um, Virginia Department of Health. Thanks. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Mary Beth DeMarco and I'm the Outbreak Net Enhanced Epidemiologist on the Foodborne Disease Epidemiology Team at the Virginia Department of Health. So in collaboration with the Virginia Rapid Response Team and the Virginia Food Protection Task Force, our team had the opportunity to partner with Pandora Radio to develop a hepatitis A radio campaign. And today I'm gonna to share an overview of our project that we had. Next slide, please. So I'm sure by now most of us are familiar with the background of the increase in hepatitis A around the nation. So to save time, I'll just um, go over this briefly. So the first outbreaks of hep A were identified in 2016 and since 2017, CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis has been assisting multiple state and local health departments with hep A outbreaks. As displayed on this map taken from the CDC webpage, 30 states have publicly reported over 26,000 cases as of September 20th. Next slide, please. In response to the increase in hepatitis A virus infection around the country, in January of 2019, the Virginia statewide hepatitis A vaccination campaign was launched. The Division of Immunization within the Office of Epidemiology at VDH is spearheading this campaign. The goals of the vaccination campaign are to increase statewide hepatitis A vaccination rates integrate hepatitis A vaccine, vaccine into health department clinics, partner with community organizations to provide vaccine and provide community education. The vaccine campaign focuses specifically on adults who are members of high-risk groups. And then in April of 2019, VDH officially declared a statewide outbreak of hepatitis A. Next slide, please. This shot slide shows a timeline that I'll walk you through to see how we got to the Pandora radio campaign. And after, I'll go into the campaign details. So as I mentioned, in January 2019, the Virginia statewide hepatitis A vaccination campaign launched. 
In February 2019, I stumbled upon a Pandora radio ad about the hepatitis A outbreak in Michigan while I was at home and thought it was such an innovative way to spread the message and provide education. I brought up the idea in our foodborne team meeting, and that was how the seed was planted. From there, I reached out to Michigan to gain insight and then reached out to Pandora Radio for more information. The foodborne disease HEPI team doesn't have a budget for large scale projects of this sort, but fortunately we were able to coordinate with the Virginia Rapid Response Team, also known as the RRT, in Virginia Food Protection Task Force to utilize their funds from federal grants in order to fund the project. The grants are coordinated through our Virginia RRT coordinator, Christy Brennan, at the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, also abbreviated as VDAC. In order to use the grant funds for this project, we had to provide an FDA disclaimer on the media images and also emphasize proper hand washing before prepping and handling food in our audio message. In March, we met with stakeholders to discuss the project potential, potential to begin working through details relating to targeting different counties and different demographics. This group included members from multiple divisions at the Virginia Department of Health, as well as members from the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. In April, VDH officially declared a statewide outbreak of hepatitis A. At this time, we were developing our script for our advertisements, as well as developing different media images. In May, we finalized our script and had it recorded by the Pandora creative team, and at that point, finalized our media images. This is also the time when we are trying to work through the purchase orders and coordinating the um, complete of the um, different orders with our VDAX partners. And after months of coordination on June 1st was when our hepatitis Pandora radio campaign finally launched. Next slide, please. Next, to get into details of the project, our goal for the Pandora radio campaign was to reinforce the statewide hepatitis A vaccination campaign and provide further education about how the virus is spread, signs and symptoms of infection, and how to reduce transmission. Due to a limited budget, we targeted the campaign in counties that had the largest number of cases or highest rates of HIV infection. We were able to target 10 different cities and counties. Pandora has the capability to target specific audiences based on a number of different demographics and details. For this project, we targeted all listeners ages 18 to 44 on Pandora. For this campaign, we utilized two different product methods, which were the audio everywhere ads and the mobile display ads in order to increase our campaign's effectiveness. The audio everywhere product reaches the audience by weaving the recorded audio message seamlessly into the listening experience between the songs and podcasts. And the mobile display products works by displaying a media image that is linked to a web page when a listener interacts with their device, such as adjusting their volume or skipping the song. The mobile display is meant to be an attention-getting image that draws the listener in and allows them to click the advertisement for more information. So there were over 1 million impressions or ad views to our campaign during the month of June. And as a breakdown, the Audio Everywhere ad was played over 695,000 times and the mobile display ad was played over 404,000 times. Next slide. Please. This slide shows our different media images that were used for the campaign. The two on the left were displayed when the audio ad played in the image on the right with the poop emoji was our attention getting image for the mobile display option, which again displays when a listener interacts with their mobile device. Next slide, please. Because it's a webinar and I wasn't certain how transmitting the audio would go, on this slide I provided a script to our recorded audio everywhere image, or audio everywhere message. Um, and then additionally below is a link to the audio if you'd like to listen to it on your own time. Uh, we'll give it a second if you'd like to read the message. All right, next slide, please. Our biggest goal was to increase awareness to the general public and provide education. We were able to calculate a few measurable results to gauge our success. 
Compared to the month prior to the campaign, there was a 198% increase in unique page views to the public-facing VDH hepatitis A virus landing page during the Pandora campaign. Additionally, compared to the same time period in 2018, there was a 37.6% increase in adult hepatitis A vaccine doses administered in the 10-county area. We cannot directly calculate the increase in vaccination due to the Pandora radio campaign, but we'd like to believe that our project played a small part in the increase in vaccination rates. As previously mentioned, the mobile display image was linked to the VDH public facing hepatitis A page. So when a listener interacted with their device and saw the mobile display, they could click the image and direct them straight to the page. Click through rate or CTR is the ratio showing how often people who see the advertisement end up clicking it. We had a target CTR benchmark of 0.25 and surpassed this goal with a CTR of 0.33 with 1,321 total clicks. Male listeners aged 18 to 20 and 40 to 44 had the highest click-through rate at 0.49, and female listeners 35 to 39 were also highly engaged at a click-through rate of 0.38. Next slide, please. Like any project, we had our challenges and our successes. Some challenges we faced were funding. The cost of advertising can be extremely expensive and we were challenged with the amount of funding we had available in order to expand the project. Another challenge was coordinating the purchase and finance projects with our VDAX partners in order to have the purchase order approved and payment received. Lastly, it was a challenge trying to navigate in the communications and advertising world. There was so much more to it than our team would have ever thought. For example, choosing your tone and age and direction of the voice that you would like in your audio advertisement. One of our greatest successes was the positive interagency collaboration. Other successes included a significant increase in views of the public facing VDH hepatitis A webpage the implementation of a new method of media advertising, and the establishment of a relationship with a local Pandora radio representative. Next slide, please. And thank you so much. I've left my contact information on this slide, and feel free to reach out to Virginia if you'd like to learn any more, if you have any specific questions. Thanks. Thanks, Mary Beth, that's great. Um, can we cut to the next slide, please? So um, I originally wasn't going to talk about what occurred in Rhode Island, but then I decided to because it's different in that we didn't have an outbreak, and I think there's some less lessons learned in that. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that, um, which I have nothing to do with, but we have got an excellent vaccination program in Rhode Island, and and I think we we saw what prevention um, does in, in this case, and it's the old ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, in Massachusetts, a neighboring state, there were 502 cases. Uh, New Hampshire, which also borders on Massachusetts, had uh, 209 cases, I think was their the latest count. Uh, they've got a similar population to Rhode Island. But uh, this whole year, we've had four cases of hepatitis A, which is background. And I think the, the real difference there was that um, our vaccination program has been highly successful in reaching kids for years. And you get that herd immunity where a lot of people just, um, you know, are resistant to it. Uh, the other thing that we did do is, is you know, situational awareness and, and being involved with things nationally. We saw the, the outbreak starting and back in October of last year, we sent out a notice to all of our food establishments uh, about controls. And we emphasized uh, control measures for hepatitis A, but also for norovirus because uh, we're going into norovirus season around that time of the year. And many of the controls are the same. No bare hand contact to ready foods, you know, talk to your workers. Uh, if they come in with yellow skin, yellow eyes, obviously have them go see a doctor, those kind of things. Uh, and then the other thing that we did is um, we've got what's called the road to end hunger in Rhode Island, where we've been working with food establishments to donate food to soup kitchens and food pantries. Well, that list came in handy. We had a GIS map that showed all the soup kitchens and food pantries. And we were able to, to provide that to the vaccination program. They worked with our epidemiologists and disease control. And over 1,000 vaccinations were given at soup kitchens and food pantries to the homeless, the drug users, 
Um, and there was also a festival, I guess, w with some gay individuals there. So we targeted the highest risk groups and, and also at the prison. So uh, again, prevention, uh, getting ahead of the curve, and I think getting ahead of the curve, we, we prevented an outbreak from occurring here. Um, next slide. So kind of a summary of, of all of our discussions so far. So, uh, and, and then we'll kind of open it to questions after I've got some general announcements um, about some funding that's available from ACTO. So one of the things that we talked about, I think, from multiple speakers is obviously talking to, uh, having people talk to their employees uh, and excluding jaundice employees until they're tested. Uh, obviously, uh, promoting excellent hand washing, the no bare hand contact, the ready foods. And, and I think that these kind of controls that have been in place in the food industry for, for quite some time in most states have helped us prevent a lot of uh, illnesses and outbreaks associated with the food establishments. The vaccinations, uh, obviously targeting high-risk individuals, the homeless, the drug users, the prisons, the men having sex with men, uh, those tended to be the, uh, the highest risk populations. And a number of those people will work in food establishments. So if we're targeting them and they work in food establishments, again, uh, we're preventing problems from occurring, occurring there. Um, one of the things that we've seen is a lot of food workers who have become ill with hepatitis A because, again, they fall into those high-risk groups and, and some of them just other exposures through person-to-person -person contact. And Dr. Foster gave uh, her decision tree, which was excellent, which you can go back to in the slides. And again, all of this information will be on the AFTA website in about a week. Uh, but again, if, if you're after two weeks of exposure, well, immune globulin is not going to work. So, so there's multiple criteria you look at. So are they within two weeks of exposure? If you've been exposed to somebody with hepatitis A, uh, what was the person's um, hand hygiene like? Uh, what's their personal hygiene like? Uh, you know, if they're dirty, they don't wash their hands after using the restrooms, obviously your risk is much higher. Um, did they make your salad with their bare hands versus using gloves? Obviously that increases risk uh, tremendously. Um, was there repeated exposure? Do, um, is it an institution or some other place where you eat there repeatedly? All of those things increase your risk. And if you've got multiple of those uh, risk factors, and that obviously increases the risk and considering immune globulin as, uh, as a means to prevent others from becoming ill if you're within that two weeks of exposure. Um, I'd like to jump to just a, a few informational things and then we'll open it to questions on, on the hepatitis A. The, the next slide, please. All right, uh, so one of the things is uh, we talked about the links being online. So one of the things we've also done here is I, I just put a link for you and I don't expect you to copy this, so it'll be online. Uh, but the, the uh, email we sent to food establishments um, and then the, um, we've got some links in there to hand washing posters and other documents. Um, you know, there's hyperlinks in there and, and uh, Lisa and others had hyperlinks. So you can go to our website and pick up all these links and for additional materials. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so a couple of other things we want to let you know about. Uh, there's some other webinars coming up. October 25th, there will be one on food service risk factor violation trends. So, um, you know, what's being found most often and what should we be targeting? Uh, November 8th, uh, we're targeting also at 2 o'clock norovirus. Uh, just in time pressure for retail uh, food industry and regulators. So again, you know, that time of the year, we tend to see a lot of outbreaks in healthcare facilities and, and in food establishments. So trying to time these webinars for when the risk is the highest. And, and again, with hepatitis A, we're going into cold weather. So very soon people are going to be going into shelters and when you go into shelters, if you've got somebody with hepatitis A and their hygiene's not great, all of a sudden the potential for person to person transmission increases. So again, trying to target our webinars at the highest risk time. Uh, next slide, please. So AFTO has got a, a number of uh, grants available, uh, money uh, basically from FDA. So FDA has put some funds for 2020 retail uh, program standards. Um, there's approximately $2 million that AFTO has to give out. And there's four different project categories. There's small projects, moderate projects. The moderate ones are the ten to twenty thousand dollars. There's training grants, and there's also food protection task force funds. Uh, and you can go to the AFTO website um, and pick up more information on that. And the deadline for applying is October 15th. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing we wanted to let you know about is the National Association of County and City Health Officials 
has got a retail program standards um, mentorship uh, program and some funds available. And let's see, look at my notes here. The uh, I believe that's uh, like 14 to 24,000. It is. Uh, so there's uh, 14 to 24,000 if you want to be a mentor or a mentee. Um, you know, if you're a mentor and you've got uh, four different mentees, you can get up to $24,000, and uh, this is to promote the retail program standards. Uh, again, the deadline for that is October 15th. Okay, and let's see. We'll go to the last slide, please. And then we'll, uh, we will open it up to questions from anybody. So, uh, and, and the questions uh, I'd like to keep to uh, hepatitis A. So for any of the speakers, uh, anybody online, uh, please uh, just unmute your phone and, um, and call in and um, you can ask a question to anybody. Yeah, this, is, this is Randy. Thanks, Ernie. So for the Q&A, everybody who's listening, if you want to input your question into the question dialog box or there's a button to raise your hand, either option would work. And then we can go ahead and read the question to the panelists. So if you want to go ahead in the audience and do that now. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we have two questions, Ernie. Uh, the first one we have here is, does the United States have an endemic rate for hepatitis A still? That's the first question. Hi, this is Monique Foster over at CDC. We are not an in, considered an endemic country for hepatitis A like other countries, um, uh, namely India um, or even China. Uh, we transitioned to low endemicity uh, in the last half of the last century. Um, so typically our incidence rate for hepatitis A in non-outbreak times is between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 per 100,000. Um, that map that Dr. Julian shows, shows that in 2018, and that's based on preliminary data, the incidence rate looked to be around 3.8 per 100,000, which is a dramatic increase. And those are based on preliminary numbers. The 2018 data has not been finalized yet, so I have to add that caveat. Back in the pre-vaccine area, rates were as high as 20 per 100,000 in um, the Western states and some other areas. So we are not endemic. And our, I think our last surveillance report showed an incidence rate of around one per 100,000. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, were any efforts made in either Michigan or Virginia to disseminate information to food workers in languages other than English? So this would be to Michigan or Virginia. Uh, this is Lisa in Michigan. Uh, yes, we had um, had all of our the documents that I mentioned. All of them have been translated and are available online in uh, Arabic, Spanish, Chinese, and Korean. And this is Mary Beth from Virginia. Nothing um, on our Pandora campaign. Um, was in other languages that was all in English, but we did have the documents um, that were in other languages that were distributed with our other vaccination campaign that we were doing. Excellent, thank you. And I think we have a caller on the line, uh, Leo. Um, actually, I think the hand just went down. Let me see here. Uh, let's go with, uh, oh, excuse me. Caller Ruth, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your line. So, Ruth, your line is unmuted. You can ask your question. Uh, hi, this is Chris. Um, she uh, sent me the link. Um, so, I work, I have to help train people to grow oysters. Well, I'm an, I'm an aquaculture technician, and they deal a lot with obviously growing oysters, and they're hiring people on their farm to help do a lot of labor um, and they may or may not know these people that they're hiring. Do y'all have any suggestions for screening people that may or may not having diseases? Do y'all have any experience with training, you know, farmers that are starting these new businesses and um, or some of them even own um, restaurants that are hiring people for, to shuck oysters? Um, and do y'all have any suggestions for screening people that 
may or may not ha have, you know, hep A or other types of infectious diseases that you don't want getting into their oysters. Because, um, I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of work around barnacles and, you know, obviously shucking oysters and handling them. It, it's pretty rough work. And, um, you know, it, I, I work with them myself and, you know, barnacles and oysters it, it, constantly. You're scraping your leg and that kind of thing. That gets on your oysters and you're selling it. Um, or it gets around that, you know, you got hepatitis on your oysters. You know, that's that could be a sink your, sink your company really, really quick. Hey, this is Laura. Um, I can chime in on, on some of that. Um, the FDA has an employee um, health and illness uh, handbook online that, that covers some of this sort of screening of food workers when you hire them. Um, so that would probably be the first place to start, and it does specifically cover hepatitis A. Okay, great. And then we have the next question is uh, from uh, Brandy Hoff. Oh, Brandy, go ahead. Um, you know, the other thing is obviously one of the things that Marler, uh, Bill Marler has been promoting is, is vaccinating food workers. And, and CDC is not there because they're really not high risk for transmitting disease. But in, in this case, I mean, that's one of the things is obviously the person's been vaccinated. You've got one less illness to worry about with that individual. So, I mean, it's just uh, something else that they can look for. Most employees, well, and, and younger, younger individuals at this point in time uh, with vaccination programs in a number of states will have been vaccinated in the past. So that depending on the age, right now you're seeing a lot of the middle-aged people getting sick because they weren't sick in the past and they weren't vaccinated. But the, the newer people, uh, over time, we should see in less and less cases. Okay, we have, uh, I think we have one more question here. Um, is there any correlation of increase in says HAV an influx of undocumented travel across southern border. Hi, not that I'm aware of. Typically, um, individuals who are coming from endemic countries are already immune to hepatitis A because they were typically infected when they were young children. So. Um, I'm not aware of any increase in incidents that we're seeing because of um, uh, travel across the border. Okay. And we have one more, oh, actually we have two more questions. Uh, next question, uh, this would probably be for, this is gonna be for Michigan and Virginia. Uh, how many Hep A vaccinations were given in Michigan and Virginia last year and how often did you offer vaccinations to the general public when the case was related to a restaurant illness? Mm. Well, this is Michigan. Uh, since I work for the Department of Agriculture, I'm actually not privy to the number of vaccinations um, total that were given last year, but uh, that, that information may be available on the um, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services website, uh, so we can always take a look and see if that is available there. Uh, and that is the, um, like I said, michigan.gov forward slash hep A outbreak. Um, now, any time that a food facility was identified and there were a number of them, um, PEP generally was offered if in fact uh, there was the opportunity to provide that within that two-week window. But uh, there were some times, however, when food workers um, were identified and the two-week window was already um, passed, and so that couldn't be there. Uh, I don't have that number ahead of me right now, though. I'm sorry. Again, vaccination is something that is outside of uh, Michigan Department of Ag's purview. And this is Mary Beth from Virginia. I also don't have that number in front of me. Um, it would be to get it from our Division of Immunizations. Um, but um, also, like she had said, um, we would offer a PEP to the different employees at the restaurant if 
it was in the time frame still, but um, right. Yeah, right. We don't typically offer it to the public unless we know there was bare hands contact and the person worked while infectious and, which has been mentioned before, if it was within the two weeks where we could offer PEP. Sometimes it just it takes longer to, to find out about these cases. So um, we're not in a, in a place where we could offer PEP to the public. Okay, we have a, another question here, and I think this is will go to the states as well. Do any of the states involved in the outbreaks featured today have mandatory Hep A vaccination requirements for retail inspection staff, either at the state or local level? Uh, well, in Michigan, does not require our inspectors to have uh, hepatitis A vaccinations. No. Neither does Virginia. We don't have that as, as a requirement in Rhode Island either. Okay, uh, I think I got two more popped up in here. So the next question is, uh, have directed efforts been made to partner with state restaurant associations to provide vaccination clinics to food workers? In Michigan, I would I couldn't say that it was the Michigan Restaurant Association, but there has been uh, concerted efforts with local health between local health department and certain uh, food facilities and retailers uh, when and if there's been infected food workers uh, to provide PEP for uh, exposed food workers. Yes. Yeah, this is Ernie in Rhode Island. Uh, we didn't do it this time. Uh, in the email, we talked about food workers, um, you know, could get shots, and that's a way of reducing risk. Uh, we've uh, probably over 10 years ago, we, we had a, a situation where we had about 2,500 people get shots because it was a food worker and a, obviously a high volume establishment that was positive and hygiene was kind of questionable, and we ended up giving shots. And at that time, uh, we worked with the Hospitality Association, which represents restaurants in Rhode Island, and we ran clinics around the state. And we had a, a bunch of people who were, uh, you know, vaccinated at that time. Uh, we also have uh, Johnson & Wales University here, and, and at that time they, they offered it um, to their students, the culinary students, um, coming into the university. Um, they stopped doing that, they, they told me recently, but um, they did it at that time. So I think that also helped reduce our risk back then. Okay, we have a hand raised. So we have a question from, uh, let's see here, actually. Oh, that hand went down. So I think that is the last question. Let me double check the uh, question queue real quick. All right. Oh, we do have one new question in the question queue. Uh, has there then any correlation between an outbreak of Hep A being traced back to delivery service workers who deliver the food to consumers but are not employees of the restaurant? Hi, this is Monique at CDC. I'm not aware of any outbreaks, um, to my knowledge, of a delivery worker um, causing transmission in that regard. It typically like other speakers have mentioned, requires a lot of breakdown in hygiene, being symptomatic at work, having bare food contact, or if a person is eating at a restaurant um, multiple times and being exposed that way, or, or if there's some contaminated food product being served in the restaurant. But the, the short handling time of a delivery person who doesn't directly touch food would probably not be likely to cause transmission. So looking at the question queue, Ernie, I think that is the last one. I'd like to thank all the speakers and uh, everyone who called in. 
Uh, again, uh, in about a week, this will be on the website. Uh, you can go there. Um, and if anybody couldn't call in, again, they can download it there, and you, know, you can pick up the links also on the website. So uh, thank you very much. And again, um, we'll have a, in November um, a webinar on norovirus. So again, talking, uh, talking about things at, at high-risk times. So thank you, and have a good day.